Batalla uh, Zohair, and uh, she is ready to introduce us the webinar in two minutes' time. And thank you so much for your effort and for your time, our colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Yes. Um, I will. Yeah, I, I will post the to you the link of the YouTube. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, it's here on the in the webinar chat box. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the webinar link now is in the chat box. And uh, if you cannot join us in the webinar, or your colleagues are shouting because they uh, can't uh, join I, us in I, the I, webinar. Yeah, I, I would. Am I? Uh, I'm still. Okay. Okay. Sorry if any inconvenient. Okay, now. I dump everything now. Okay. Who is uh, joining us? Okay, no. Okay, that's fine. That's me. Um, Professor Saham Marzouk is with us tonight. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Heba, uh, I think it's all yours now. Everything, uh, the webinar is recording. The webinar is on YouTube. And uh, I would like to welcome all my colleagues in attendance of Dr. Heba. Uh, Emma Allah Zuhair, she's a chair of the webinar tonight. Uh, she's a uh, um, lecturer of anesthesia, intensive care medicine, and brain management at Cairo University. And thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hello, everybody, everywhere. Good morning and good evening, or good evening according to your time. Uh, I'm Heba Atullah. Uh, it's my pleasure to join the webinar today with all the mega online anesthesiology team. Thanks a lot, Dr. Saad, for inviting me, and thanks for being always uh, the hero behind the scene. Okay, I'm very delighted today to welcome two of our distinguished speakers who are joining us today, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Quirino Biacevoli, he's from Italy, uh, and uh, Dr. Sharanya Nama, she's from USA. I would like also to express my warm greetings to all the elite panelists and to all our esteemed audience tonight who are attending today's webinar. It's actually, it's a great honor to be with you. Okay, uh, let's introduce our first speaker. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Quirino Biacevoli. He is currently the head department uh, of anesthesia and intensive care at San Philippe Neri Hospital, Rome, Italy. He's a visiting pro uh, professor uh, in the university at the University Campus Biomedico de Roma, Italy. He is also a visiting professor uh, in, at the University of San Cyril and Methodonius, Skopje, Macedonia. He is also a president of World of Scientists Society of Anesthesia, Siva, and the president of Clinical Risk Society. Also, he is a board member of Quality and Safety Commission, World Federation of Society of Anesthesia, and a member of the Board of Federation. European de Medicine uh, Bruxelles. His areas of expertise is pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of hypnotics, opioids, and sedatives, pathophysiology of cranial trauma. He holds special interest in uh, clinical risk management in intensive care and anesthesia. He's holding now a new research on molecular basis for anesthetic agents. He's talking to us today uh, taking us actually back and deep to basics, name yani, speci uh, specifically pharmacology and genetics in a very comprehensive and very, inter uh, very interesting lecture. Please, uh, Dr. Vichavoli, please go ahead. We're eager to, wait, to hear from you. Thank 
Excuse me, kindly, Dr. Quirino, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, great. I cannot hear my voice. We are just listening. We can hear you well. Yes, but uh, uh, I send a video with a pre-registered oh, voice, so uh, just not to repeat my my talk because it's very difficult. So uh, I would like that you send uh, my uh, registration with my voice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just because a moment. It's very complicated. For this, I send everything. Yeah. I play the lecture from here. Do you want to play it from your side or no? No, no. I, I would like that you send my pre uh, prepared uh, registration because uh, I choose some part to say and to modify. And then now uh, uh, I am not able to repeat the same. Okay. 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 What do you want me to do now? Do you want to stop uh, sharing the slide? Do you want to share it from your computer? Uh, I can uh, just uh, um, follow you okay. like a, a, a single participant, but uh, please, can you send my video with my voice and my slides? I can, I can send it to you now. Uh, no, it is, it is difficult to be honest, but um, I can share it. Laura, sentono la tua voce, sei tu che non la senti. Yes, uh, I, okay. I can share it now. But can we start from the beginning? And I will, uh, I will start. I, yeah, I, I stopped the voice now. But you can start now, yourself. Is it okay? Bro? Uh, Try now, please. Tu, tu, tu parli adesso in diretta, lo vuoi fare? No, I prefer to to hear my voice, my registration. Okay. I don't okay. want to talk now. Okay. 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 You see now? Is it okay like that? No, I cannot hear. Is it okay like that? Okay. Okay, no problem. Uh, you can send the registration also if I cannot hear my voice. No problem. Okay. Uh -huh. I don't know why I cannot hear my voice. I'm sorry. But we hear you. Do you hear? Okay. Okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, I, I follow you the slide. No problem. Okay. okay. I know what. <laughs> Okay. 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 Is it okay like that? This is not the first one. We we need to start from the beginning. I just send my video just to avoid all this problem. Amore, sono loro che lo mandano, non io. Se lo mandavo io potevo aggiustarlo, se sono loro non posso farci niente. Tu, Lia, l'hai detto che non lo senti, loro non riescono a farlo. E loro, 
culpa. Devo attivare l'audio, l'ho attivato. Posso mandare il video io? Posso, se loro sbagliano non posso farci niente. visualizza su YouTube. Sì, ma è per partecipanti, non per te. Allora io non posso chiudere il collegamento. Ma no, perché ti faranno le domande. Sì, ma alla fine, ma non so a che punto sono. No, lo vedi dalle, dalle dai slide? No? no, non corrono, sono ferme. Allora, you see the screen? Yes, no sound. chiedono a me perché non si sente. Il problema è loro se non si sente. <ride> Today there is no time to discuss about this. So we can define a pharmacogenetic like a study 
of inherited the differences in the variation of the drug metabolism and the response. Here are the key words of my presentation. Pharmacodynamics is the study of how the drug exerts mm. its effect in the body. Pharmacokinetics is the study of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and description of drugs. Point of mutation is defined as a change in a single nucleotide of a genome that occurs 1% or less. Polymorphism is the presence of two or more alleles for a gene or DNA sequence in a population. Single nucleotide polymorphism is a point mutation occurring in greater than 1% of a population. So there is a very old aphorism that say a surgeon who uses the wrong side of the scalp and cuts his own fingers and not the patient's. If the same applied to drugs, they, should, they would have been investigated very carefully a long time ago by Ruth and Patridge in 1849, which are the objectives. The clinical problem are multiple active regime in the treatment of most disease. Secondly, we have a variation in response to therapy. Further, we have an unpredictable toxicity sometimes, and also a great variability in cost. So we have a choice games decision. Here we have all patients with the same diagnosis, but all the, all, they are all the same. No, we see people in orange and in blue. That means that they are a different. Uh, uh, behavior uh, in confront of the drug. And so we can say that uh, some of them, the blue one and the orange one, are non responders and uh, all are toxic responders. So they need alternative therapy. All the other needs standard treatment because they are not responder and the patients not to predispose, they are, oh, sorry, responders and the patients not to predispose to toxicity. What exactly is a genetics? Genetics is the study of heredity and of course of variation between individuals. But the genetic constitution can be always the same in uh, our person, no, because of this genetic constitution can be modified by many external factors, as you can see, and also by internal factors. So the situation can change and became very complicated. What about the chromosomes? We know that every human cell, with the exception of the gametes, contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, and also code for all the proteins in every cell. What reside in the cell nucleus? Each chromosome contains one DNA molecule. What is DNA? DNA is a building block formed by four nucleotide bases adenine, guanine, thiamine, and cytosine. With a single strand, sugar phosphate backbone, and a double strand, double helix, bound by the hydrogen bonds, always AT and CG. How we can have the anatomy and the expression of a new gene? We need always a promoter that the active DNA and with the mechanism of transcription and make an array transcript and with a process, processing process 
in the nucleus, we have a new mRNA that gave, with the translation, in the cytoplasm, a new protein. What is a SNP? SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism that consists in variation in DNA sequence measured in 1% of the population and uh, occupied by variation that cause of uh, human differences and also alter protein synthesis and uh, mRNA function. Here we have uh, two different uh, examples of uh, SNPs and the human variation. In this uh, side, we have uh, no uh, uh, pharmacological change. So we have a, a synonym of SNP, SNP. In fact, we see that also if we have some small changes, A and G, the, the molecular remain proline and proline. On the other side, we have non synonymous SNPs because a change give a, a transformation from glycine to another compound. Other polymorphism insertions, we can take the example of a nucleotide change in cell T and A, repeat the change of the function and the glucorine, glucorine, uh, glucoronidation in the children syndrome and in many drug toxicity. Other polymorphism are called the deletion and the duplication. Deletion is about, for example, in cytochrome P2 disease, delete several nucleotide base pairs. So we have a loss of function, decreased the metabolism, and another phenotype that is called poor metabolizer. And uh, the other mechanism, the copy number variation in cytochrome P2, D6, we have an increased copies of the same gene and the phenotype change in ultra extensive metabolizer. What about allele? We can have alternative forms at the genetic locus on one chromosome. Most largely, humans have two chromosomes which carry the same or two different alleles one or several variants of a gene, and the usually specific site within a gene. What means a heterozygous with versus homozygous? Homozygous is when two of the exact same alleles. Heterozygous when they have two different alleles. This belongs to the human genome project, that is the study of the genes and their function. This project began in 1990 and was coordinated by many departments in the USA, which are the goals of the human genome project to determine the sequence of the three millions of DNA nucleotides, chart variation among the sequences, label function of uh, more than 30,000 human genes, address ethical, legal, and social use. We know that uh, genetic polymorphism of drug and the disposition of the drug card, uh, targets uh, is growing list of a published example. In the here, we have just a, a very common example of a drug, clopidogrel. <laughs> and if we look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics with a, a normal cytochrome 2C19 uh, wild type, we have the right action of pufflet function. But if we look at the pharmacokinetics of a, a, another uh, type of cytochrome type 2 or type 3 
the pharmacokinetics change and we have a higher clopidogrel exposure. And also, if we consider the number three different uh, cytochrome type we, uh, from a pharmacodynamic point of view, we have a loss of inhibition of the aggregation. So we see how the genetic can change the action of a very common drugs in different patients. Yeah, we have uh, uh, many pharmacogenomic examples. The list is very short also because it's very old, but and, uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, many different drugs, very common drugs, uh, and uh, so we must be very careful with our patients. What do we mean for our comprehensive optimization of the patient care? To use a disease, the knowledge of disease genotypes, the knowledge of infection defects genotypes, the knowledge of toxicity risks genotypes, just to have supportive care genotypes. In other words, the pharmacogenomic is the branch of science concerned with the identific identification of the genetic attributes of an individual that lead to the variable responses to drugs. Interesting, the science have evolved to also consider patterns of inherited alteration in the fine population, such as the specific ethnicities that account for variability in pharmacotherapy aortic response. The term pharmacogenomics is used more generally to refer to genetic polymorphism that occur in a patient's population, for instance, in ethnic group, as opposed to individual patients. Until recently, the ultimate goal of pharmacogenomics had been the development of a prediction model to forecast debilitating adverse events in specific individuals and more recently across population based on similarities in age, gender, or more commonly race or ethnicity as contrasted with the rest of the population. However, <clears throat> in spite of this never newer usage, pharmacogenomic may predict the extreme deviation of some patients from predictable pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic responses. We call idiosyncratic response. In recent practice, pharmacogenomic tools coupled with the proteomics and other advanced molecular diagnostics are emerging as cornerstone of individualized patient therapy, especially when differential genetic response to xenobiotics are considered across specific ethnicity. Pharmacogenomics seeks to identify patterns of genetic variation that are subsequently employed to guide the optimal medica medication regime for individual patients. Historically, we know that the approach to drug therapy has been large, largely empiric. Clinical study that determined the maximum tolerated dose and the reasonable toxicity in a narrowly defined population, typical leads to the safe and effective administration of drug for most individuals. However, the empiric therapy in the individual allotype variation in drugs response occur with the patient's outcomes, varying from a complete absence of therapeutic response to potential life-treating adverse drug reaction. Genetic difference may account in part for some of a well-documented variability 
the response to drug therapy. Obviously, many factors other than genetics, such as age, sex, other drugs administered, and underlying disease states also contribute to variation in drug response. However, inherited differences in, in the metabolism and the disposition of drugs and the generic polymorphism in the targets of drug therapy, for example, metabolizing enzyme or protein receptor can have an even uh, greater influence, influence on the efficacy and toxicity of a medication. Interestingly, age, gender, and endemic geographical differences may themselves emerge as a phenotypic consequence of a differential epigenetic control. This implies that the heterogeneity in the control of a gene expression based upon age, gender, geographical mm -hmm. location is itself a lifelong changing process that is under the control of molecular epigenetic switches that either activate or inhibit groups of genes as a, a unit. Specific identification of this epigenetic control, a special population, for instance, differences in pediatric or geriatric protein expression in immune cell when compared to the general adult population, can provide value and clue to how special population based on age, gender, pregnancy, and the even geographical location respond differentially to specific drugs. This information can be incorporated in optimal therapeutic design. A study published in 2011 in China on the heterogeneity in drug metabolizing of genes in globally defined population has provided profound insight and even stronger evidence for the significance and the relevance of a sleep induced variation in drug metabolism. The study compared differences in 283 drug metabolizing enzyme and the transporter genes across 62 globally distributed ethnic groups and demonstrated that patterns of emergence of SNPs in specific population spread out across the world. In other words, now we know that what is important to consider in our patient is the differentiation. That means one size does not fit all. What happens in anesthesia? Here we have some example. If we make a constant infusion rate, 0.50 microgram per kilo per minute, we need to consider that the the some covariates like age, different age, different gender, different weight, different age can change completely the amount of the effect site concentration in microgram for milliliter at steady state. That means that if the amount of the, of the effect site the concentration is different, will be have also different uh, uh, clinical effect. Here is the same for propofol. We have a, a constant infusion rate, 8.0 milligram per kilo per hour, and uh, different, we consider different age and the different other covariates like gender, weight, and the height. And we see how different is the uh, uh, effect site concentration in microgram per milliliter at a steady state, and of course, different clinical manifestation. Why we have so many pharmacokinetic products? For this reason, 
because of the different out of reach of the, the result of a study in a different way uh, using a different kind of analysis than the use using different covariates. What is very interesting, the last new pharmacokinetic models about morphine, in which our colleague Sarton use gender difference, differences in KO that brings to a more realistic pharmacokinetics model of the morphine. Here I have the same for opioids, and then we see also the description of their study, and here the author of this pharmacokinetics model. But what is, is important to show is this one, because of this figure show the different covariates that the single author has used to reach a good approach to a good pharmacokinetics model that is possible to use for more patients. And we can see they use uh, central volume, KO, uh, the different KO, and the, the half time KO. And also the gender, the weight, the weight, uh, 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 and uh, also what is important, the lean body mass. How we can go out from this very complicated situation? <clears throat> Recently, Eleved found a new approach. This approach has been applied to a limited extent that already the studies have produced uh, uh, property models for children and adults, neonates through to adults, for both obese and non obese adults. This test studies testing allometric scale in rates children and adults. Considering consideration of ontogenic and other scaling or lean body mass are likely necessary to allow a single model to span the range of uh, from young to children to elderly to obese. Allometry studies make differences in terms of ratio of the object's dimension. Two objects of different sides but common shape will have a very dimension in the same ratio. Take, for example, a biological object that grows as it matures. Its sides change with age, but the shapes are similar. Studies of ontogenetic allometry often use lizard or snakes as a model organism, both because they lack parental care after birth or etching and because they exhibit a large range body sites between the juvenile and the adult stage. These are often exhibit allometric change during the ontogeny. In addition, the studies that focus on growth allometry also examines shape variation among individuals of a given age and sex, which is referred to as a static allometry. Comparison of a specific of a species are used to examine interspecific or evolutionary allometry. The goal of this study was to determine a single pharmacokinetics model for propofol and remifentanil with a robust predictive performance suitable for general purpose application in a wide range of patients under diverse intraoperative clinical condition. Allometric scaling is an exchange that deviates from isometries. It is any change that deviates from isometry. The physiological effects of drugs and other substances 
in many case scale allometrically. Here are the allometric scale. On this left side of the figure, we have all the parameters that were used to reach the scale, and these are the estimated value take from the different uh, publication on this uh, topic. What is important to consider the very uh, short confidence limit that is very narrow because it's 95 percent. That means that the bias between the lower and the upper limits is very, very narrow. Here we have the representation of how the postdoc estimated the pharmacokinetic models parameters plotted versus weight. And you can see with the triangles, males and open cycles, females. And the GL is a remifactor in clearance. These are all the author and all the story, uh, all the authors and all the study that gives uh, all the uh, uh, range uh, value. We know that the phase one and phase two uh, metabolism are the principal uh, process in our body. We know that the metabolism uh, in, uh, is uh, divided into uh, generally involves the conversion of the lipophilic substrates and the metabolites uh, into more easily excretable water-soluble forms. Drug metabolism take place mostly in the liver and is divided into two major categories, phase one, oxidation, reduction, and the hydrolysis reaction. In phase two, metabolism, conjugation reaction. The hallmark of the experiment in pharmacogenomics diagrammed in the figure illustrates how differences in the rates on the phase two metabolizing enzyme and acetyl transferase NAT2 can affect the half-life and the plasma concentration of the drugs that are subject to that two metabolism. Phase one metabolism enzyme are responsible for approximately 59% of the adverse drug reaction cited in the literature. In terms of evolution, the cytochrome P450 enzyme was one of the first biocatalytic machinery to emerge on Earth. This ubiquitous enzyme contains an iron porphyrin ring cell, essential to the chemical reaction they catalyze. During this oxygenation reaction, the oxid oxidative state of iron in the porphyrin ring change resulting in spectrophotometry absorption maximum observed 450 nanometers, which contributed to their name. Cytochromes are generally located in the endoplasmatic reticulum and the mitochondria in the human cell, of which the endoplasmatic reticulum are isoform and particularly important to the field of drug metabolism. In terms of their organ distribution, they are found in greater amounts in the liver, the intestine, and to a somewhat 
lesser extended in other organs such as skin, brain, lungs, and kidneys. Hepatic, renal, and intestinal endoplasmatic reticulum drugs uh, 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 are involved in the biotransformation of a plethora of drugs and the endogenous substrates in a human male by oxygenation of the target substrate molecular and mediated by differential oxidation state of the central iron atom in the enzyme. The high genetic variability of cytochrome P450 for under the 50 enzyme constitutes the most important of the phase one metabolized enzyme with a total of 57 gene encoding for cytochrome 450 enzyme. Of this, cytochrome P2D6, cytochrome P2C9, and cytochrome PC19 are highly polymorphic and account for upward of about 40 of percent of the body phase one metabolism. In this figure, we can see the genetic polymorphism and the drug metabolism and the receptor mediators. Here we have the drug metabolism genotypes, and here, if we consider the polymorphism of a drug exposure to the drug, plus the genetic polymorphism of drug sensitivity, Due to drug receptor genotypes, we can find the, uh, an important percentage of the therapeutic effect and the toxicity effect on our patients. Uh, here are the single diagram uh, related to drug concentration that should be a bit important. are the clinical implication of a genetic polymorphism. We have two categories, metabolized uh, phenotype. The first one is poor to intermediate metabolizer. The second one is an ultra rapid metabolizer. The first uh, group has a effect on drug metabolism very slow. The second one, fast, which are the clinical integration implications. For the first group, pro drug will be metabolized slowly into active drug metabolite. May have accumulation of a pro drug. Active drug will be metabolized slowly into inactive metabolite. Potential for accumulation of active drug, patients can require lower dosage of a medication. The second group, pro drug rapidly metabolizes into active drug. No dosage adjustment needed. Active drug rapidly metabolized into inactive metabolite leading to a potential therapeutic failure. Patients require higher dosage of an active drug. So if we take in consideration what happens Out the cytochrome 2D6 up to 25% of the drugs are metabolized via this cytochrome. We know that the phenotype variation between some enzymes can have an outstanding outcome on drug therapy. And also the variance of 
cytochrome uh, 2D6, uh, cytochrome 2D6 is a well-studied instance of a drug metabolite single enzyme coding gene that exhibit polymorphism. This enzyme gene product X on many xenobiotics, including many common prescription drugs, as uh, such as uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. <coughs> Sorry, fluoxetine. Uh, antidepressants, beta blockers, mm. calcium channel blockers, and many other drugs. Uh, we know that uh, uh, research has shown that while approximately 10% of Caucasia, Caucasia, up to 7% of uh, can have this polymorphism and can be interested, interested by this uh, uh, polymorphism of cytochrome. The medication and the receptor gene can change also. Drug effects linked to polymorphism, drug metabolic enzyme, can involve the all these kind of drug that are really many, just a, 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 a very simple uh, example, but you can find many other. 30, we know that the 35% of the population carries a non-functional 2D6 allele. This non-functional allele may increase the risk of diverse drug reaction, especially in patients with polypharmacy. Interestingly, of the 43 alleles of the cytochrome 2D6 gene, about five alleles account for poor metabolic phenotype. Among the many reasons of a genetic variation, an interesting one that especially, specifically applies to cytochrome P2D6 is a gene duplication. As the name suggests, in some ethnicity duplication of the allele coded for 2D6 may result in increasing increased protein expression and therefore ultra rapid metabolism and marked reduced activity of some drugs. The percentage of population that show gene duplication for cytochrome 2D6 across different countries is really different. And with reference to some drug like tamoxifen, the role of cytochrome 2D6 is not so much of a metabolism of this drug as it is to activate it by conversion of an endoxifen inside the cell. Pharmacogenetic variation of cytochrome 2D6 has been shown in clinical trials conducted in the UK and Germany to lead to variable, variable therapeutic outcomes to maxifen treatment of estrogen sensitive cancer. These are medication and the receptor. What happens? On this left side, we have the, the cytochrome involved here, or other enzyme involved. Here, we have the medication, and we can find very common drugs. And here, we have the different effect linked to polymorphism. Genomic is well studied uh, in this enzyme, cytochrome P2D6, instance of a metabolizing enzyme 
coding gene that exhibit polymorphism. We know that we have a different type of polymorphism, like cytochrome D6, 19%, cytochrome P3, 3A4, uh, 36%, and the other form of cytochrome. And in this figure, we have a representation of their distribution in the population. And we know that uh, this uh, uh, enzyme are linked to the change of the modification of the effect, the clinical effect on many, many drugs that we can see a very simple list. We know also that the African Americans and 4.8 of Asian have a poor metabolizer phenotype. 5% of Caucasian and 4.9 of African Americans have the ultra rapid mm. metabolizer phenotype. But we have another differentiation for Asian, the percentage of us. Uh, uh, CIP uh, 2D6 uh, ultra rapid metabolizer shoots up to 21%, perhaps leading to the therapeutic failure or the need for increased therapeutic dosage of drugs such as the SSRI in this target population. 35% of the population carries a non-functional 2D6 allele. This non-functional allele may increase the risk of adverse drug reaction, especially in patients with a polypharmacy. Interestingly, of the 43 alleles of the cytogram 2D6 gene, about five alleles account for the poor metabolic phenotype. Among the many reasons for genetic variation, an interesting one that especially applies to cytochrome 2D6 is a gene duplication. As the name suggests, in some ethnicities, duplication of alleles coding for 2D6 varies up in increased protein expression and therefore ultra rapid metabolism and markedly reduce activity of some drugs. What about uh, uh, chemotherapy and uh, uh, anesthetic drugs? The final consideration too little is known. The growing number of patients undergoing surgical procedure with general anesthesia soon after receiving chemotherapy occasionally such treatment can be given during surgery. Therefore, it is worthwhile and prudent to consider the pharmacological interaction between anti-cancer and the anesthetic drugs. A specific topic is poor represented in published work. The low coverage seems to be due more to a lack of knowledge and understanding rather than an absence of an interaction between the two drug types. Since the number of the individuals receiving chemotherapy in the preoperative periods is rising, patients who might have potential dangers and unwanted effects are also due to increasing number. Thus, we should be vigilant in the carefully surveillance of this interaction, as well as broaden our knowledge of in vivo and in vitro findings and investigation. Classic cytostatic compounds and modern drugs should be extensively studied. And the new anti cancer therapies closely interacting with the immunological responses need to be better understood since the clinical effectiveness 
might be modified by an aesthetic that they are currently used. More frequently, tumors are being managed in a multimodal integrated approach with the medical, surgical, and the radiotherapeutic aspect. However, certain anesthetic drugs have been reported to adversely affect the cell mediated immunity, immunity in the surgical stress response. Although the toxic effects of some chemotherapeutic drugs have been reported, although there is no formally known pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamic interaction, clinical problems might arise, arise from this adverse uh, effect. We take in consideration of some of the most common chemotherapies, drugs. Azotioprin is a, an anti-metabolite immunosuppressor frequently used during renal transplantation surgery that might interact with anesthetic drugs, such as a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. Leonicin is a widely used as a cyto toxic antibiotic. The main problem associated with the use of this drug is a progressive pulmonary fibrosis. The interaction between lidocaine and pleomachine potentiates the anti-tubor effect mm. of the antibiotic. Lidocaine, which similarly provide the lethal effects and the DNA damage of pleomachine in L 12-10 cell was also effective during, only during or after bleomycin exposure. Some patients receiving bleomycin for testicular cancer, when given high dose, dose nitroxoxide the mixture for anesthesia, have been known to experience acute respiratory distress syndrome that might modify anesthetic management. We have a cyclophosphamide, that is an alkylating drug that is extensively used in treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, lymphomas, and many solid tumors. In vivo setting, simultaneous exposure of cyclophosphamide at allotype can lead to rise mortality in animals without the cause of death being clarified. Rose Dow and colleagues showed how the exposure of mice to 0.5% allotain PR after an intraperitoneal dose of cyclophosphamide produced a substantial increase of in the lethal effect of the cancer and the Toxorubushin is a cytotoxic antibiotic and anti Tracycline that is used to treat acute leukemias, leukemias lymphomas, and various solid tumors. Supraventricular tachycardia related to the use of this drug is a rare complication, but high cumulative doses are associated with cardiomyopathy and total cumulative doses are usually restricting to 450 milligrams uh, for minus because a symptomatic and potentially fatal heart failure is common at increased doses. Patients with cardiac disease, elderly people, and those given by cardiac radiation should be treated with a caution. Methotrexate is used as maintenance treatment for childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Other uses include the choriocarcinoma, nonotkin lymphoma, and several solid tumors. Can be used in intratracheal methotrexate for CNS prophylaxis of acute, 
for the acute lymphoblastic leukemia in child and as a therapy for established meningeal cancer or lymphoma. We must consider that it inhibits the enzyme the hydrophosphalate reductase, which is essential for the synthesis of purines and the pyrimidines. My conclusion is that adverse drug reactions are a cause of significant morbidity and mortality to patients at the source of a financial burden to healthcare system. Of the wide spectrum of adverse drug reaction, the most concerning to the anesthetist remain anaphylaxis and malignant hypertension. Although the incidence of anaphylaxis under anesthesia is difficult to ascertain, it occurs commonly enough that the most anesthetists will manage at least one case in their career. A wide range of drugs given the perioperative period and the variable presentation of anesthetized patients can delay diagnosis and treatment and adversely affect outcome. Furthermore, despite the improvement in testing, causative drugs can still be difficult to identify as adverse reaction may be mediated by a mechanism other than AG activation. With an increase in the reporting of anaphylaxis to newer anesthetic drugs such as Sugabadex, combined with a change over the recent decades in the most likely the causative operative agents, this imperative anesthetics remain up date on recent developments. In addition, we should be vigilant to patients' characteristics, including pharmacogenetic variation that may predispose to adverse drug reaction in order to help minimize the risk of the reaction. The severity of a drug reaction to perioperative drugs means morbidity and mortality remain high. Anesthetists are the medical specialists most likely to witness adverse drug reaction. This is due in part to the nature of a perioperative period in which patients are exposed to a large variety of potential allergens. These include anesthetic drugs, antisepsis, diets, contrast latex, antibiotics. Adverse drug reactions are a source of significant morbidity and mortality, responsible for up to 6% of hospital admission, carrying a mortality of 2% and costing to the National Health Service around 466 million pounds per annum. The last problem, but not at least, we know that we have uh, drugs that are brand, other are generic, but very few colleagues know that we have drugs that are called biosimilarity. So the drugs market up today can offer three different products, the brand, the generic, and the biosimilar. Biosimilar drugs are offered confused with the generic drugs. Both are marketed as a cheaper version of a costly name brand drugs. Both are available when drug companies exclusive patents of a, yeah, an expensive new drug expire. And the both are designed to have the same clinical effect as very pricer counterparts. But the biosimilar drugs and the generic drugs are very different, mainly because while generic drugs are identical to the original in chemical composition, biosimilar drugs are highly similar, but close enough in duplication to accomplish the same therapeutic or clinical result. Another key difference is the generics are copies 
of a synthetic drugs, while biosimilar are modeled after drugs that use a living organism as important ingredients. But many experts hope that two will share a critical commonly and that, like generic biosimilar, will dramatically lower the cost of biological drugs. In other words, a biosimilar product is a biological product that is approved based on demonstrating that it's highly similar to an FDA-approved biological product known as a reference product and has no clinical meaningful differences in terms of safety and effectiveness from the reference mm. product. <clears throat> Only minor differences in clinically inactive components are allowable in biosimilar products. The World Health Organization published its guideline for evaluation of similar biotherapeutic products in 2009. The purpose of this guideline is to provide an international norm for evaluating biosimilar with a high degree of similarity with an already licensed references biotherapeutic. Here we have the two different situation. On the left, we have the contrast between the standard regulatory pathway to establish safety and efficacy of a new biological product on the left and the biosimilar a regulatory pathway to establish a match between the biosimilar and the reference product on the right. So if we consider the two parameters and we understand that on the right, the main goal is to establish similarity to the reference medicine. On the left, the main goal is to determine the clinical effect for each indication. So the target is very, very different. And uh, it's uh, spontaneous to have a question, what about the safety and effectiveness in this situation? I'm not able to respond to this question. So I asked uh, and help to the former uh, Secretary of State, Ronald Rumfeld of the United States. There are reports that there is no evidence of a direct link between Baghdad and some of these terrorist organizations. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> Excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? Uh, I'm not several unknowns, and I'm, I'm just I'm not going to say which it is. But, 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 I hope that uh, uh, you like and uh, find interesting. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Goodbye. Thank you, Professor Corino. That was great. Thank you so much for enlightening us with such uh, a new information and great points. That was very interesting subject. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for attending today or speaking today and waiting for upcoming uh, webinars joining us. Uh, please, I kindly ask uh, the attendees 
to write down uh, your uh, questions, if any, uh, in the question and answers chat box. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we will do our best to answer them. Now, please allow me to introduce our second speaker, uh, our young assistant professor, Dr. Sharanaya Nama. She is an interventional pain management physician at the Ohio State University Medical Center in Columbus, USA. She grew outside. Uh, she grew up outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Attended Templeton University School of Medicine, and then completed her residency and fellowship training at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. She has been practicing pain medicine for six years, and her interests includes pain management in patients with substance use disorder and perioperative pain management for patients with opioid tolerance. She lives in Dublin and USA. She's uh, presenting to us her lecture on perioperative buprenorphine management. Please, Dr. Nama, share uh, the floor is yours and please share your screen. Thank you so much for having me speak at this webinar. And yes, I'm gonna be talking about perioperative uh, buprenorphine management today. Can you run the slideshow, please? Can you see it? You cannot see it? No, uh, it's down, down, go down, go down below, below the slide. Below the slide, there is a banner below the slide. I, I've already, it looks like I'm sharing on mine. You're, you're sharing, yes, but just to go to the share now, what you share down underneath. I think you... Yes, yes, in this line, go right, go right, a little bit more right. Yes, yes, down, 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 go down. Yes, a little bit, no, a no, little bit left. The left. Yeah, no, no, not much, not much. One more, one more, one more, one more. The one left more. to the no, minus, right, right, right. to the go minus. Right. Uh... Go right, go right, go right, please. More, more, one more right. Um... One more the right. sign, the sign one left more. to the minus. Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, this oh, one here. Uh, yes. Okay. Perfect. I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank Dr. Mahdi, uh, Dr. Sohair, and Dr. Barbara Rogers, who's my mentor, for uh, making the introduction. I have no disclosures. Can everyone hear me? I'm switched to my AirPods. Yeah, yeah, we do, we do. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right. So the objectives of the, today's talk is one, I would like um, to increase understanding in the pharmacologic differences between buprenorphine and other opioids. Secondly, I would like to highlight the consequences of stopping buprenorphine in the perioperative period. And third, I would like to discuss and review strategies to optimize pain control in this patient population. I'm going to start with a hypothetical clinical scenario first um, to kind of give an example of what could happen. Um, this is a 42-year-old patient with past medical history of end-stage liver disease hep from hepatitis C. He was admitted postoperatively after undergoing a liver transplantation. This patient has a history of opioid use disorder, had been abstinent from opioids, and drug use for about four years and was successfully treated with buprenorphine and naloxone combination called Suboxone, its trade name here. Um, the patient received his last dose of Suboxone about 36 hours prior to surgery as instructed by his clinicians. They gave him a call and they said, um, we have a liver uh, waiting for you, stop taking your Suboxone. And so the patient was not restarted on Suboxone postoperatively. Um, and this patient agreed to the plan of restarting his Suboxone prior to discharge from the hospital. Unfortunately, um, things did go downhill. His clinical course, postoperative course, did not go well. 
Um, initially, the patient refused to be weaned off of his uh, patient-controlled analgesia with um, hydromorphone. Uh, he also refused to restart the buprenorphine um, as previously agreed upon uh, and threatened to leave the hospital against the medical advice. Um, we found, they found um, drug paraphernalia in his room on post-operative day eight. And this patient continues to do poorly after discharge. Um, examples being that he works for a drug dealer now as a uh, drug mule, or he was incarcerated. Um, and of course the liver is um, in acute rejection. So I wanted to give some background of the opioid epidemic in the USA. Um, I know there was uh, there's so many people from so many countries. Uh, so I I didn't I couldn't look up other statistics from elsewhere, but I will present what I know about my own country. So unfortunately, in uh, 2020, approximately 90,000 Americans died from opioid overdose, and this was a sharp rise. Um, from the 70,000 deaths uh, that happened in 2019. Um, this was from illicit drugs and also uh, prescription opioids. Um, and they think that the COVID pandemic was, has largely contributed to this very dramatic rise. In fact, um, 2017 seemed to be a turning point for us um, where deaths from heroin and prescribed opioids actually started coming down, as you can see in this chart here. Um, but unfortunately, the introduction of synthetic opioids uh, like fentanyl has um, made deaths worse and also the opioid, the COVID pandemic. And so how do we treat patients with opioid use disorder? Um, the treatment options are detoxification versus um, using a medication to help with uh, treating opioid disorder. Detoxification is simply abstinence from the offending medication or drug, and then symptom management um, for the withdrawal. Um, and then this is usually done in conjunction with cognitive behavioral approaches and therapy. Um, and then the other option along with therapy is either, it's called medication treatment of opioid use disorder or medication assisted uh, therapy. So M-O-U-D or M-A-T. And so um, they're transitioning in the US from calling it M-A-T to calling it M-O-U-D. And so this is when we use a medication to reduce cravings and withdrawal symptoms. And so the three most commonly uh, used medications are buprenorphine, um, methadone, and naltrexone. And so I'd like to focus today's talk on buprenorphine. Um, it is a unique opioid. So in the US, it is FDA approved for opioid use disorder, the treatment of opioid use disorder, acute pain, and also chronic pain. Um, there are several formulations uh, for opioid use disorder. There's buprenorphine alone, uh, which is called Subutex, and Suboxone, which is a buprenorphine-naloxone combination. Both of these are sublingual. It is thought that the naloxone uh, helps, the, helps the buprenorphine be more abuse deterrent, because if this were to be injected intravenously, the naloxone would be able to counteract any effects of the buprenorphine. Sublocade is a extended release subcutaneous injection. And this is actually what's becoming more and more popular. Once the patient is on a stable dose of suboxone, they can be transitioned to sublocade and they get an injection once a month. Um, there are a couple of other formulations, uh, probufine and bonavale. The probufine is a subdermal implant and bonavale is a buccal film. These two are less common and they are more expensive. 
for acute pain, there's an IV formulation of buprenorphine that we call buprenex um, that is available. And only certain services in the hospital can use this. And then um, for chronic pain, there is a, these two forms of buprenorphine that are in much smaller dosing and micro dosing uh, quantities. So Balbuca is a buccal film and the butrans patch is a transdermal patch. So it is, this medication is mechanistically different uh, from other opioids. It's considered a partial mu receptor agonist. So when it does bind the mu receptor, it has a lower intrinsic activity, um, but it also has a very high receptor affinity and slow dissociation rate from the receptor. It is also a full kappa receptor antagonist, full blocker of the kappa receptor. Its half-life is about 26 hours, so relatively long, but it does have analgesic properties. Those last from six to eight hours. It is not the full 26 hours. Uh, it's thought to be anti-hyperalgesic and have a ceiling effect on respiratory depression. And so this figure uh, shows the proposed mechanism of how um, buprenorphine is analgesic and anti-hyperalgesic. Um, through the, op the mu opioid receptor, it has its analgesic effects, um, but it's thought that through the kappa opioid receptor and blocking that, um, it ultimately can block NMDA receptor firing. And so the NMDA receptor is what uh, is thought to be uh, the reason, the activation of the NMDA receptor is what's thought to cause central sensitization and hyperalgesia. I wanted to show this diagram of um, all the three different uh, treatments for opioid use disorder and their effect on the opioid receptor. So methadone is considered a full opioid agonist and so will have a full opioid effect. Buprenorphine um, is this orange uh, line right here and that has a partial uh, agonist effect and naloxone and naltrexone as well um, are blockers and antagonists, so they have no effect at the opioid receptor. And so this is a uh, diagram from a study done by Dahan et al. And it shows the effect of minute ventilation with increasing doses of buprenorphine versus fentanyl. So in the uh, lab animals. So um, on the left, you can see the effect of increasing doses of fentanyl for the minute ventilation of this animal, it precipitously decreases down to zero. However, for uh, buprenorphine, the minute ventilation does decrease. However, it stops decreasing, it plateaus at a certain level, making it theoretically safer, um, even if a patient overdoses, uh, it takes too much of their buprenorphine. Um, their ventilation doesn't go to zero, theoretically. And so how does buprenorphine prevent relapse in patients with opioid use disorder? It has this exceptionally high affinity to the mu receptor, like I mentioned before. So this actually prevents other opioids from binding to the mu receptor. Um, and also leads to the lack of euphoria that happens when patients uh, were, if patients were to use. And ultimately this decreases cravings for, um, you know, using fentanyl or heroin, etc. The goal of when you're treating somebody with uh, opioid use disorder with buprenorphine is to saturate as many mu receptors as possible. But unfortunately, it's these unavailable mu receptors that are now blocked by buprenorphine that makes pain control um, with opioids in these patients very, very difficult. 
And so this is a chart from Greenwald et al that shows um, receptor occupancy at different doses of buprenorphine. So a patient who's taking two milligrams daily, it's not that they have a, a, about 41% of their new receptors blocked. And so 16 milligrams seems to be like that magic number um, that uh, clinicians try to uh, put patients on. Um, it is thought that it blocks about 85 to 92% of the mu receptors in the CNS. And then 32 milligrams really virtually binds all of the mu receptors. So this uh, diagram is from Zubieta et al. And they published um, back in 2000, a study where they took healthy volunteers and they gave them different doses of buprenorphine. So we have one, the control group, one that was given no buprenorphine, one that was given two milligrams and one that was given uh, 16 milligrams. And they were then administered radio labeled carfentanil to see um, how much of this carfentanil would then bind um, and took fMRI images. And so you can see the control and the zero milligram buprenorphine uh, patients, uh, they had pretty robust uh, binding of the radio labeled um, carfentanil. However, the two milligram group, they had less binding and the 16 milligram group had even less binding. So I wanted to discuss um, what exactly is buprenorphine induction and um, what, what, uh, what is uh, the steps in the process, okay? So an induction just means slow initiation and titration of buprenorphine. It can be done in uh, various settings, office-based setting, in the hospital, inpatient, or even in the emergency room. And even there's home protocols for patients um, to go home and uh, start buprenorphine. And so the patient must be in clinical withdrawal prior to doing a buprenorphine induction. And so uh, this would be based on the clinical opioid withdrawal scale, and they would need to have a CAL score of greater than 12. Um, and so the reason for this is that it helps prevent a phenomenon called precipitated withdrawal. Um, as we all know that, you know, withdrawal from opioids is terrible. It's, you know, the uh, very, very uh, profound and uh, terrible experience, but precipitated withdrawal is much, much worse. It is very intense and it's very rapid withdrawals that can happen within 20 minutes of taking buprenorphine. And um, it's never something that we would want to put these fragile patients through. So for a regular induction of buprenorphine, the patient must be abstinent from any full opioid agonist for about 12 to 16 hours. And so this is what day, it's usually a two day process. And day one looks like this. Um, we have a patient um, who has not been on any opioids, who has a Kyle score greater than 12. Um, and we give them four milligrams of uh, Suboxone. We wait two hours. We see if they continue to have withdrawal symptoms. Um, if no, uh, it, if uh, they do not have any withdrawal symptoms, we can go on to day two. Um, if they continue to have withdrawal symptoms, we just keep repeating the process until they reach 12 milligrams. So on day two, then we give the dose that took away their withdrawal symptoms the day before. We also ask them, did they have any additional withdrawals when they went home? And then we keep adjusting. Every two hours, we give an additional dose of Suboxone. And so the big question for us as anesthesiologists is how do we treat patients undergoing surgery or those who are in acute pain, you know, coming in with a fracture, something like that? And so the considerations for choosing a strategy uh, will depend on the anticipated pain severity of the procedure, risk for relapse. And is the, is the um, surgery emergent or planned? The classic approach 
for uh, buprenorphine management that even I, when I was in fellowship, this is kind of how we practiced, um, is we would discontinue buprenorphine three to five days prior to surgery and um, supplement the patient with full opioid agonists, oxycodone um, usually to prevent withdrawal. Okay, and then the plan was to always restart the buprenorphine um, after recovering from surgery. Okay, and this approach is based on pain patients. Actually, it's based on patients who are taking buprenorphine for pain, and it's reasonable for that patient population. You have somebody who's on a butrans patch or balbuca, um, it would make sense to do this. However, it may, as we've found out, it may not be the best strategy for patients who are taking buprenorphine for opioid use disorder specifically. And so here are the problems with discontinuation. There's an increased risk of relapse while the patient is not on buprenorphine, okay? Um, there's a risk of post-operative respiratory depression or accidental overdose. Um, the mechanism for this is that um, the patient experiences this uh, opioid deficit when buprenorphine is, is eventually eliminated from the system. However, we are typically giving these patients full opioid agonists in the meantime, right? They were treating their pain maybe with the um, oxycodone or hydromorphone. And this is a recipe for disaster. We have buprenorphine, which we consider like a safety net to prevent respiratory depression is leaving the system. And these uh, hydromorphone that we're continuously giving is ready and available to bind those free opioid receptors. So it's very, we need to be very careful and monitor these patients postoperatively. It's also very complex management and a logistical nightmare. So to avoid, you know, the sudden drop off of buprenorphine from the receptors, you should really taper the dose prior to surgery. That's a long process. You know, that'll take weeks. And then reinduction after surgery, like I said, for um, with the induction process, the patient needs to be abstinent from opioids. How many patients in the post-operative period are not experiencing pain and need you know, oxycodone or hydrocodone? So um, there's a very slim window for when we can actually restart these patients. Um, and they need to be restarted ideally before they're discharged from the hospital for their own safety. And this really increases our length of stay. Uh, surgeons really don't like that, <laughs> to have to wait until they are weaned completely off their opioids, then to induce uh, Suboxone prior to discharging. And so uh, I wanted to see what my, how we fared in my institution uh, regarding this challenging patient population. And so we did a, in 2019, we did a retrospective chart review um, and included patients who had buprenorphine and methadone listed as their home medication and who underwent OR uh, surgeries in our ORs. We excluded patients who were pain patients, primarily like the ones that are prescribed butrans patch and the ones who are uh, had visits to our palliative care clinic. And so we wanted to see, you know, how are we identifying these patients on MAT or MOUD? How are we verifying the dose? Um, and what is the timing for when we're restarting these medications? And I wanted to see what surgical services had the most of these patients. And so for buprenorphine specifically, it was very variable, but about 60% of patients were restarted in the buprenorphine at some point postoperatively. That meant 40% 40 40 of patients were not. Methadone, on the other hand, about almost 90% of patients were restarted on methadone postoperatively. So it looks like we're much more confident and comfortable managing patients on methadone than we are for patients who are on buprenorphine. And so some of the study limitations and also barriers that we uh, ran up against was that this patient, these medications are underreported. The patients do not inform the clinicians that they are on these medications. Um, and 
we we are working on our medication reconciliation process to try and capture more of these patients, but it's because of the stigma associated with being treated for opioid use disorder. These patients think that the clinicians are going to treat them differently. They're going to think they are bad people. And so they do not even want to tell us that they are being treated for this condition. Another thing that we figured out is that any time a patient had a prescription for these medications, but that was outside of our hospital system, it was very difficult for us to capture. And so getting back to the stigma portion. So um, as anesthesiologists, when we do our preoperative evaluation, uh, sometimes we're the first people who may even hone in on this issue, who may ask the patient, uh, you know, if, if you have issues with this. So um, I would urge everyone to consider when they do screen for substance use issues to screen it like an allergy. Um, do you have any medication allergies? Do you have problems with uh, substance use disorder or addiction? Um, Destigmatize it. Let's not put it in the social history. Let's put it as a medication problem. You know, and this is actually a suggestion from our local fire uh, chief, uh, fire department chief. This is how they, the first responders, they screen victims like in the field. And so recommendations are changing about how we should be uh, managing these patients uh, uh, postoperatively. And I'm gonna go through a few of the recent like reviews and publications. And so the first thing that uh, got my attention was back in 2019, the Pain Medicine Journal published an editorial and stating that patients on buprenorphine for opioid use disorder should continue it through the perioperative period. And so then um, the British Journal of Anesthesia, they published a special article um, regarding practice advisory for perioperative management of buprenorphine. And so um, this is one of the schematics from that article and basically stating that we need to continue buprenorphine throughout the perioperative period. Continue it preoperatively, no weaning down, okay? And in the hospital, continue it postoperatively, continue um, really focus on non-opioid adjuncts like NSAIDs, anti-inflammatories, gabapentin, presidex, dexmedetomidine, and lidocaine. Um, only if analgesia, we need further analgesia to consider um, other full mu agonists. And then discharge, the patient should be on some dose of buprenorphine at discharge from the hospital, okay? and also to really limit the amount of uh, full mu agonists like you know, oxycodone or hydromorphone that we discharge the patient on. And so wanted to quickly review um, the cornerstones for what an anesthesiologist can do to help these patients. Um, the, for preoperatively, we can give them acetaminophen, celecoxib, pregabalin or gabapentin, um, intraoperative opioid sparing is very helpful. Um, consider infusions like ketamine, lidocaine, and dexmedetomidine. Regional techniques are very helpful and should be encouraged in this patient population. So if you can do nerve blocks or some form of neuraxial anesthesia. And then postoperatively to really follow a protocol-based management strategy like, you know, continuing the buprenorphine, continuing the um, non-opioid medications. And so then um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine um, published um, an update in 2020. And even then, non, these are non-anesthesia, non-surgical uh, clinicians have recommended that discontinuation of methadone or buprenorphine before surgery is not required, not required. 
And finally, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia just this summer published a special article um, with uh, recommendations from a multi-society expert panel. And they have also suggested that we do not discontinue buprenorphine. We continue it at the home dose. Postoperatively, we continue multimodal analgesia. We can consider dividing the doses of buprenorphine instead of giving the one dose in the beginning of the day to split it up three times or four times a day. And then um, to discharge the patient back to their, um, to what they were taking preoperatively. They also actually go on to say that there's pretty moderate level of evidence that patients who are not even taking buprenorphine, but who have a history of opioid use disorder, that we should consider starting buprenorphine preoperatively and setting them up with a postoperative follow-up for the opioid use disorder. Okay. The one challenging aspect um, or patient population is this emergency urgent surgery, like the initial patient that I discussed, this uh, uh, liver transplant is uh, considered an uh, emergent urgent surgery. And so what do we do in those cases? So say a patient comes in after a motor vehicle accident, has a femur fracture needs to be taken to the operating room, and then we find out that they have a history of opioid use disorder and that they are taking buprenorphine. We are lucky then to actually know this information. What if the patient was you know, in a coma, something like that, and we couldn't even know this. Um, so the first question that needs to be asked is, is the patient currently receiving opioids for pain? So if this is you know, the patient with a femur fracture, are, they are likely to be uh, receiving opioids. So if the answer to this question is yes, the next thing we need to determine is when was their last dose of buprenorphine? Was it less than 24 hours ago or more than 24 hours ago? If it was less than 24 hours ago, like my, uh, the chart on the right, hooray, this is good news for us. We can continue the buprenorphine at their normal doses and um, can management uh, is simplified, and then we can revert back to um, multimodal analgesics and um, going forward there. However, if the last dose of buprenorphine was greater than 24 hours, that's when it is problematic, okay? So I want to remind you again that if the patient, if there's a patient who is on opioids, who's not clinically in withdrawal, giving them buprenorphine is is dangerous almost. It gives them the precipitated withdrawal. That's one of, if that is a dreaded consequence that we want to avoid. So if they have missed uh, the buprenorphine dose greater than 24 hours, we cannot restart buprenorphine uh, immediately. And the patient needs to be closely monitored with pulse oximetry postoperatively so that um, we can try to avoid any profound respiratory depression. And then we try, we recommend trying to restart the buprenorphine prior to discharge. In my institution, we have a MAT team, a medication assisted treatment team who will do this for us. Um, so that would be our recommendation. Um, there is also, back to this restarting, there, we are working on new protocols. There's some literature out there about using those uh, micro dosing uh, for reinduction of buprenorphine while the patient is still on opioids. Um, I was talking about Belbuca, which is a micro dose, microgram dosing of buprenorphine at the beginning of the presentation. They use very small doses while the patient is still on, let's say oxycodone, oral oxycodone to try and to slowly reintroduce uh, buprenorphine to try and avoid the um, precipitated withdrawal. This is still an evolving area of research to try and figure out which is the best method. And just want to um, 
go over briefly the strategies of um, how we can really optimize multimodal analgesia in these patients preoperatively. Let's give them acetaminophen. Um, let's give them gabapentin, maybe 300 milligrams. Be careful in patients who are over you know, a certain age or their creatinine clearance is low. And if there are no contraindications, anti-inflammatories like celecoxib will be very helpful. Um, this goes without saying, we definitely recommend regional anesthetic techniques uh, when indicated. Um, please uh, make sure you counsel the patients and really convince them that regional is a good idea for them. Um, intraoperatively, we want to continue multimodal analgesia and limit our reliance on opioids because remember these patients, the buprenorphine is blocking those opioid receptors anyway. We would need to give a large dose of opioids and intraoperatively, uh, large doses of opioids are not always necessary, right? So we could give ketamine infusions, um, consider giving esmolol um, to have hemodynamic control if necessary. Um, and consider avoiding remifentanil. You know, I know in certain cases it's unavoidable, like craniotomy. Um, however, there's recommendations that maybe sufentanil would be a better choice in these patients. It's another ultra short acting opioid, um, but it, and it also has a very favorable mu receptor affinity, um, but perhaps it may um, have less incidence of hyperalgesia or rebound pain after the infusion has stopped. Post-operatively in, in PACU and even up on the floors um, in their uh, unit, you're gonna anticipate these patients are gonna have high levels of pain. Um, it, it is going to happen. And so we would recommend administering um, short acting opioids that have a very high affinity to the mu receptor so that they could try and compete with the buprenorphine because we're gonna continue to give buprenorphine in these patients. And so we wanna um, just compete with that at the receptor. And so fentanyl and hydromorphone are what we uh, recommend, um, especially in PACU. Fentanyl in the, in the recovery room uh, could be a reasonable option. We recommend avoiding morphine due to its poor mu receptor affinity. So some key points is we want to continue buprenorphine perioperatively. <laughs> That goes without saying. Discontinuation of buprenorphine can lead to dis significant morbidity, including withdrawal, increased risk of relapse, or the opposite, and respiratory depression and over opioid overdose. Um, we want to utilize multimodal analgesics and opioid sparing techniques as much as possible. And this redosing of buprenorphine within 24 hours is very critical. It's makes management a lot easier if you're able to catch these patients and redose them within 24 hours. And so a couple of take home messages. Um, I wanna urge everyone to consider, I, this says opioid use disorder, but any substance use disorders like a chronic illness, I would urge everyone to think of it like diabetes or hypertension. And we need to continue the medications for these conditions in our patients. Uh, we wouldn't stop insulin in a diabetic. We wouldn't stop uh, you know, medications for hypertension. So let's continue the medications for opioid use disorder. Um, the perioperative period is a very, very critical time for these patients um, with opioid use disorder. It could be a turning point in their life. And that, as that was seen in my hypothetical clinical scenario for the patient um, with end-stage liver disease and the transplant. Um, and I would argue that preventing opioid-related morbidity in these patients is equally important as the surgical intervention itself. So please keep that in mind. And so I wanna say thank you again. And these are the two things on my mind all the time, COVID and, and opium. Anyway, any questions, please let me know. Thank you a lot, Dr. Sharania, for the great and very comprehensive and very interesting lecture. I enjoyed myself. 
And I think uh, there is no questions till now. So Professor Dr. Corino Biacciavoli and Assistant Professor Dr. Shara Sharanya Nama. Thank you, thank you uh, for both of you again, for your time and your efforts and for sharing your experience, experience and enlightening us with the, the, all the updates. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you will, uh, Dr. Dr. Quirino, you will make your promise to learn Arabic as you told me, right? My promise is to resend the video because uh, I understand that uh, there are so many technical problems uh, and uh, I will resend to Dr. Saad my video registration. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, no problem. You, uh, no problem. Uh, I think that Thank you. Uh, too complex, okay, the matter that I, uh, I show, okay? Thank you Very so much. Uh, thank you so much. So this concludes the webinar. Uh, Dr. Saad, uh, you will end or me? Uh, yourself, yourself. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, actually, it was a, a pleasure to have you all with us. Uh, and I would like to send uh, my warm welcoming after the speakers, my warm welcoming to the, the panelists, uh, especially uh, Dr. Sahar Marzou and Dr. Nashwa Nabil. Uh, they are my dear, very dear mentors, actually. And for Dr. Yasser Reda and all the panelists, the esteemed panelists, and, and all the, the extend and extend the, the greetings to all uh, the kind audience. Uh, and sorry again for the small technical error at the start. And thank you uh, and all the appreciation to Dr. Saad. He's always working with us hard and uh, supporting us uh, in behind the scene, as I told you. And thank you. See you in the upcoming meeting, inshallah. Thank you. Have a great Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Bye-bye.